Hello, and welcome to Inverse Happy Hour. For this reading, I thought I'd take something appropriate to our moment in time here with the coronavirus. It takes place in a hospital uh, in the midst of a war context. It's cheery stuff, indeed. It's from my second novel, Broken Angels, uh, and we'll plunge in right at the beginning. So, here we go. I first met Jan Schneider in a protectorate orbital hospital, 300 kilometres above the ragged clouds of Sanction 4, and in a lot of pain. Technically, there wasn't supposed to be a protectorate presence anywhere in the sanctioned system. What was left of planetary government was insisting loudly from its bunkers that this was an internal matter. And local corporate interests had tacitly agreed to sign along that particular dotted line, for the time being anyway. Accordingly, the protectorate vessels that have been hanging around the system since Joshua Kemp raised his revolutionary standard in Indigo City had had their recognition codes altered in effect being bought out on long-term lease by various of the corporations involved, and then reloaned to the embattled government as part of the tax-deductible local development fund. Those that were not pulled out of the sky by Kemp's unexpectedly efficient second-hand marauder bombs would be sold back to the protectorate, lease unexpired, and any net losses once again written off to tax. Clean hands all round. In the meantime, any senior personnel injured fighting against Kemp's forces got shuttled out of harm's way, and this had been my major consideration when choosing sides. It had the look of a messy war. The shuttle offloaded us directly onto the hospital's hangar deck, using a device not unlike a massive ammunition feed belt to dump the dozens of capsule stretchers with what felt like unceremonious haste. I could hear the shrill whine of the ship's engine still dying away as we rattled and clanked our way out over the wing and down onto the deck. And when they cracked open my capsule, the air in the hangar burnt my lungs with the chill of recently evacuated hard space. An instant layer of ice crystals formed on everything, including my face. You! It was a woman's voice, harsh with stress. Are you in pain? I blinked some of the ice out of my eyes and looked down at my blood cake battle dress. Take a wild guess! I croaked. Medic, endorphin boost GP antiviral, here. She bent over me again, and I felt gloved fingers touch my head at the same time as the cold stab of the hyperspray into my neck. The pain ebbed drastically. Are you from the Evenfall front? Uh, no, I managed weakly. Northern Rim Assault. Why? What happened at Evenfall? Some fucking terminal button had just called in a tactical nuclear strike. There was a cold rage chained in the doctor's voice. Her hands moved down my body, assessing damage. Well, no radiation trauma then. What about chemicals? I tilted my head fractionally at my lapel. Exposure meter, it should tell you that. <clears throat> it's gone, she snapped, along with most of that shoulder. Oh, I mustered words. I think I'm clean. I think, can't you, can't you do a cell scan? Not here, no. The cellular scanners are built into the ward decks. Maybe when we can clear some space for all of you up there, we'll get around to it. Her hands left me. Where's your barcode? Uh, left temple. Someone wiped blood away from the designated area, and I vaguely felt the sweep of the laser scan across my face. A machine chirped approval, and I was left alone. Processed. For a while, I just lay there, content to let the endorphin booster relieve me of both pain and consciousness, all with the suave alacrity of a butler taking a hat and coat. A small part of me was wondering whether the body I was wearing was going to be salvageable, or if I'd have to be re-sleeved. I knew that Carrera's wedge maintained a handful of small clone banks for its so-called indispensable staff. And as one of only five ex-envoys soldiering for Carrera, I definitely numbered among that particular elite. Unfortunately, indispensability is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it gets you elite medical treatment, up to and including total body replacement. On the downside, the only purpose of said treatment is to throw you back into the fray at the earliest possible opportunity. A plankton standard grunt, whose body was damaged beyond repair, would just get his cortical stack excised from its snug little housing at the top of the spinal column, then slung into a storage canister, where it would probably stay until the whole war was over. Not an ideal exit, and despite the Wedge's reputation for looking after their own, there was no actual guarantee of re-sleeving. But at times, in the screaming chaos of the last few months, that step into stored oblivion had seemed almost infinitely desirable. Colonel! Colonel! Hey, Colonel! I wasn't sure if the envoy conditioning was keeping me awake, or if the voice at my side had nagged me back to consciousness again. I rolled my head sluggishly to see who was speaking. It seemed we were still in the hangar, 
Lying on the stretcher beside me was a muscular looking young man with a shock of wiry black hair and a shrewd intelligence in his features that even the dazed expression of the endorphin hit could not mask. He was wearing a wedge battle dress like mine, but it didn't fit him very well, and the holes in it didn't seem to correspond with the holes in him. At his left temple, where the barcode should have been, there was a convenient blaster burn. You talking to me? I asked him. Yes, sir. He propped himself up on one elbow. They must have dosed him with a lot less endorphin than me. Looks like we've really got Kemp on the run down there, doesn't it? That's uh, an interesting point of view. Visions of 391 platoon being cut to shreds around me cascaded briefly through my head. Where do you think Kemp is going to run to? Bearing in mind this is his planet, I mean. Uh, uh, well, I, I thought... I, th I wouldn't advise that soldier, thinking. Didn't you read your terms of enlistment? Now shut up, save your breath, you're going to need it. Uh, yes, sir, yes, sir. He was gaping a little, and from the sound of heads turning on nearby stretchers, he wasn't the only one surprised to hear a Carrera's wedge officer talking this way. Sanctioned four, in common with most wars, had stirred up some heavy-duty feelings. And another thing, I've told him. Colonel, this is a lieutenant's uniform, and wedge command has no rank of colonel. Try to remember that. Then a freak wave of pain swept in from some mutilated part of my body, dodged through the grasp of the endorphin bouncers posted at the door of my brain, and started hysterically shrilling its damage report to anyone who'd listen. The smile I had pinned to my face melted away, the way the cityscape must have done an even fall with the tactical strike, and I abruptly lost interest in anything except screaming. Doesn't get much happier from there on in. So start, just tell me how you're doing, what you're doing to keep yourself uh, occupied these days. We're all stuck at home. Anything you're watching or reading? Oh, no, I'm, I've got, I got a lot to do. I mean, I've got a book to but a comic book to edit, uh, uh, plus, you know, running the house, holding my kid now because uh, he's not at school. So, uh, yeah, yeah, there's plenty to keep me ticking over. Mm -hmm. What's the last, uh, what's the last sci-fi book you read that you really liked? Say again? Did you get that? No, sorry, say it again. All right. What is the last science fiction book you read that you enjoyed? The, the last science fiction book that I read that I enjoyed, that is, wow, let me read. I've, I've, you know, I've not been reading much science fiction at the moment. Um, oh, yeah, uh, T.R. Napper. He's just got a collection of short stories come out. He's an Australian writer, uh, and it's called Neon Levi. Yeah. Uh, short stories, really, really long short stories. Uh, cyberpunk vibe. Uh, but at the same time, there's a really nice feel to them as well. Uh, he's probably worked with them in sort of development and uh, and and sort of uh, support of, of, of war torn and damage in Southeast Asia. And he's got an enormous wealth of experience to draw. So it's uh, yeah, it's it, it's really engrossing, Re really beautifully written, which is great. I mean, I, I you can't get enough of good literary writing uh but again it's got that really hard edge cyberpunk feel to it and uh yeah and some really odd angles with stuff that you don't see coming which uh, i really i really enjoyed it. it's the best short story collection i've read for quite some time cool good recommendation um i need to freeze it. <clears throat> you still there um so you mentioned that the uh this book is not uh the plot of Altered Carbon season two. I know you also worked in the writers' room on that show. What was yeah. the experience like adapting your own book into a show? Well, I mean, I the the the, the show really is. I mean, it, I wouldn't say it's an adaptation of Broken Angels. It's very much it borrows from it. It takes a bunch of the cool stuff, uh, but it's very much got its own trajectory because even at the end of season one, uh, the story was already starting to diverge from where the book had gone, and so their launch point for for season two is a lot different than the launch point that I had when I was writing Broken Angels. So I, I don't, I, I don't honestly think you could call it an adaptation. I think it's it's, it's a borrowing. If you like, they've borrowed some of the themes. They, but they've also mixed it up with a bunch of stuff from the third book, Woken Furies. Uh, so, but yeah, I mean, in terms of the writers' room, I spent time out there essentially just spinning up cool shit. I mean, that was that was my job. Uh, to go there and sort of help with the cool shit angle. And um, yeah, it was brilliant. I mean, I had a really great time. There are really, a bunch of really talented people 
and uh, you're in a room full of people all throwing ideas around and stuff and uh, it was it was great so i spent about a week out there um but as i, I watching season two i was delighted to see that some of the things they've hung on to uh you know like the um the interface guns the uh with the, the palm panels that can call the gun from across the room uh and uh, yeah, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that's in, in the two books that they, they brought in because obviously because they just loved it because they thought it was really cool, fun stuff to play with. Nice. Uh, for anyone tuning in now, we're asking questions with Richard Morgan, author of Altered Carbon, those books. If you have anything, please let us know. I'll relay those questions. Uh, I have something more broad, which is, what do you think uh, the role of science fiction can be at a time like this when you know the world is a little scary uh, what 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 value can can uh, fiction like this bring to the world? Well, I, I think the thing is that over the last ten years or so, uh, science fiction has really become the only fiction that addresses uh, the you know the real world context anymore. You know, to a real extent, we live in science fictional times, and uh, in order to address that, in order to address the, the, the contemporary context, you've pretty much got to be writing science fiction, or at least you've got to be writing with a science fiction. In People work, I think, and you're you're seeing this increasingly with a lot of a lot of literary writers. And what they are really doing is turning out science fiction. They are they are just writing stuff that has that science fiction vibe to it. So I mean, in that sense, it's not so much what we can bring to it. It's a case of we already took the place over. Hmm. Uh, what we now do. Yeah, uh, we got one question from uh, anonymous brand. Would you rather be an android with a heart or a human without one? <laughs> ah, right. Well, um, I don't know. I, I have a feeling that uh, we're going to reach a point in which we're going to become post-organic in the sense that there won't actually be a big difference between what we consider to be organic material and and what we consider to be, you know, mechanisms and machines, because increasingly we're beginning to work at the nano level. And so we rather than build things, we're increasingly starting to grow them uh, or print them out, if you like, as well. So I, I reckon that that's probably that issue of being an android or a, or a human. There's going to come a point when that's going to be almost, you know, it'll be like Blade Runner. It will be it, they, the two will be indistinguishable. It will be it will be almost impossible to tell one from the other in terms of having a heart. Yeah, heart's a useful thing to have. <laughs> as long as you don't use it too much, you know, you've got to, got to keep it protected. True. Uh, another one from the audience. Uh, what do you prefer, Star Wars or Star Trek? Uh, I, I'm not keen on either, to be honest. Uh, I mean, I enjoyed the Star Wars, the, the, the original trilogy, when I, when I saw them when I was a kid and a teenager. Uh, didn't go back for the second trilogy. Uh, and I saw The Last Jedi uh, a little while ago, while I was in L.A., in fact. Mm. It was all right, but it, it's it's just... The problem for me is that you know, I, I was watching movies like that in the late 70s. And then between uh, Return of the Jedi, sorry, between um, Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, there was this gap of, I don't know, two and a half, three years. In that gap, I saw Alien, Mad Max, and Escape from New York. Mm. And it's like that game over, man. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's tough to compete. Star Wars, yeah, it's for kids. What's your favorite sci-fi movie? So, do you have one? What's your favorite sci-fi movie? Science fiction, fiction movie. Well, that's a difficult one. I mean, I, I, I think Blade Runner has to win just in terms of sheer number of times I've watched it. I, I have must have watched Blade Runner, the original Blade Runner. I must have watched that movie 20, 25 times in my life. Um, you know, and, and I do think that at it, at, when it came out, it was, you know, the, 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 the densest and most uh, powerful imagining of a future that anyone any of us had ever seen on a screen um it still looks futuristic now i mean it's obviously got some there are some clunky things like there are no mobile phones um you know uh tdk and uh pan am are, are um you know big names on the, yeah, the neon skyline but apart from that uh it still looks pretty futuristic and i think it captured it really captured something and went on to actually shape and you know an entire generation at all sorts of different levels um so it, it's pretty hard to see anything that competes with that i mean I, I was also a huge fan of the first two mad max movies but although i love those movies it's i don't think you can say that they have anything like the cultural imprint that uh, the blade runner has so you know uh, there are a lot of science fiction movies that i love uh 
I mean, the second Blade Runner I loved as well. Um, I thought Arrival was was very impressive. Uh, there are, you know, I could make a very long list, but mm -hmm. I think Blade Runner is still the one because Blade Runner kind of defined what the future was going to look like for for my generation, and it was certainly that and William Gibson's writing were the two the twin sort of boots in the ass that I got to get mm -hmm. on with trying to write what I wanted to. I mean, you know, Blade Runner and Gibson are all over Altered Carbon as influences. Anyone who's read it will of course. see that very clearly. Mm -hmm. uh, someone else just asked, if you woke up in the year 2400 and it was an Altered Carbon reality, what would you do? Would you be terrified or would you be excited? Well, it depends very much on what kind of sleeve I was wearing, I think. <laughs> Good point. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, one of the great things about dystopian fiction is, you, generally speaking, you tend to have a protagonist who's equipped to cope. Uh, you know, that's very important, that. Uh, so, you know, if you're wearing a very, very, you know, specked up sleeve that, that, that can handle itself and you're hard-boiled enough, then, uh, yeah, it'll be fine. Um, I always figured that, you know, even if Kovach had not gone to work for Bancroft the way he does in, in Altered Carbon, he probably would have found a whole bunch of other ways to make himself useful, you know? Uh, kind of sort of ex-military enforcer types. They're always, always got, you know, there's always some way, some, some work for them to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think with, with Altered Carbon, and obviously Blade Runner is a huge cyberpunk story. Uh, I think Altered Carbon really did help reinvent and bring cyberpunk back into the mainstream a bit. Do you, do you feel that's true? Or do you feel you've seen more cyberpunk has it become a more popular genre in the years since you published your books? I d the thing about cyberpunk is that it, it was, and to some extent it remains, a marginal influence. It's by its very nature, I don't think it's mainstream. Um, you know, mainstream has kind of borrowed the, the, you know, the, the, the kind of the, the, the look, if you like. But I think cyberpunk really, you know, it was always something of a, of a marginal concern. It was always something cultish and edgy and, 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 and off the beaten track. And I don't think that's ever really changed. And I mean, it was very instructive that when the second Blade Runner movie came out, despite the huge fanfare, what you found was a very similar reaction to it, to the reaction that the first movie got, which was, it didn't do all that well, um, but people really fell in love with it, um, talked about it a lot. It, you know, there was a sort of intensity to it, but it, it missed the, the, the glare of the sort of mainstream stage. Um, mm. And that was very much the case with Blade Runner, the first movie as well. This is what people tend to forget. You know, Blade Runner itself was, was, was not a successful movie. It, it barely made its budget back. Um, and it was consigned to video really fast. And it took a very long time for, for the impact of it to be felt properly. And I think that's, that is how cyberpunk works. I think cyberpunk, a bit like noir, if you like, is that it is, by its very nature, it's not what the mainstream want. The mainstream want, you know, Marvel Universe, Star Wars, Star Trek, that's... Big, bright, cheery, uh, front and center kind of um, storytelling. And uh, that's not cyberpunk. Cyberpunk is not that. Uh, by, its, by its very nature, it's marginal. It's ed it has an edge on it. It, it. It's like noir in the sense that it costs a lot. Um, mm -hmm. You pay a price for your excitement in cyberpunk. And I think the, that's something that, especially you know, with the, the sort of dominance of the superhero genre, I think that's something that audiences are, you know, not especially inclined to uh, to go for. So, you know, it, it I don't think it ever went away. I think it was always there. Um, and it's kind of sunk into our culture and it's kind of suffused the culture in many ways. So it's there as a backbeat. But um, I don't know that it, it has ever been or ever will be super popular uh, because I think it has some hard edges to it that, that, that you know, the mainstream audience tend not to like. I think you're right. Well, on that note, I think that um, it's probably time to wrap this up. I don't want to take any more time, but I'm really thankful for you for helping us launch this series. No and, worries. Uh, great. Good luck with all the stuff you're working on. I'm sure it'll be great. Uh, have a good night and stay safe. Yeah. Cheers.